They're going to rearrange. I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank staff. I want to thank all of you for part of this uh, community conversation. Um, if you were here last time, thanks for coming back. If you're here for the first time, thanks for getting and learning about this to be here. We have agendas, sign-in sheets so that you can be able to email and learn about follow-up. We can't answer all the questions tonight. We're going to, we have experts here to give five-minute summaries. At the end of that, Mike's going to be uh, handling the question part. Uh, we have handouts for information, emails for follow-up, and um, I guess we'll get started. And then, um, John, you want to introduce? Oh, wait a minute. Um, Commissioner Allison Wright, Commissioner Mike Kennedy, Commissioner John Culpepper. <laughs> I'm Commissioner John Culpepper. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, we're excited about uh, giving you all some information, uh, starting the year off right. I'm going to introduce the uh, Adams Clark County staff members that we have here. We have Manager Blaine Williams. Uh, we have Chief uh, Jerry Salford. Um, we have Traffic Engineer Tim Griffith and Planning Assistant Director Bruce Line. So they're going to be here to help us go over these topics we've got. Uh, we'll have a question and answer session after they go through everything. So just y'all wait till the end. Just remember your questions and uh, we'll go over those. And also, there were sign up sheets. Uh, if y'all got one of those and you've got, make sure you put your email addresses on there and we'll send out follow up um, answers to some of the questions. We might not be able to get all the answers, uh, all the questions answered today. With that, I will um, start with. There you go. For staff. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you, commissioners, for organizing this. Uh, you know, it's very important that you're given information in a timely way when big decisions are being made. And in our representative form of government, these commissioners felt that it was important to pull this together. Uh, and I thank our staff for being here tonight. Uh, thank you uh, to, to Allison and the commissioners for pulling together this agenda. So we're going to follow it. And so we're going to go through all the presentations very quickly and then be, save the balance of time for your questions. And with that, I'll turn over to Chief Jerry Salters. <laughs> hey, good evening, everyone. First of all, I want to thank you for coming out. Um, I'm glad to be here with you tonight. And, and it tells me you care about your community. You're out here on a, on a cold, muddy night. Uh, I didn't know what to expect, so I brought back up. Uh, this is Officer Dorales. She's one of our new officers. She just finished the academy in December, and she's now in our NOVA training. We're certainly glad, and feel free to ask her any questions. Uh, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about 2023. Uh, once we hit January 1, it started all over for us. One of the goals for the police department should and always is to be is to make this place, make this county safer for us to live, work, and play. Um, and we were fortunate in 2023 that we reduced uh, violent crime, persons crimes, was down 6.8 percent. That's your armed robberies, robberies, aggravated assaults. Uh, aggravated assaults was actually down 11.5 percent. Uh, and for the last two years, we've seen a greater than 10% reduction in those strangulations, stabbing, shootings, things of that nature in this community. Property crimes down 2.6%, burglaries down 31.1%. I really attribute that to technology in a lot of ways. And what I mean by that is so many people have different brands of ring cameras and different things, and that's really deterring uh, burglaries and property crimes, which is helping us. Uh, entering autos are down, stolen vehicles are down. Uh, thefts are up in general and frauds up and I think that's something we're going to continue to see we're looking at this year expanding uh, our criminal investigations fraud unit just because so many people in the community have fell victim uh, to different banking frauds and things of that nature so we're going to try to put more emphasis what we see a lot of times though is once we start investigating these crimes they're being perpetrated by people overseas and then the only thing we have really is just to turn it over to the federal government and let them follow up but I believe it's important that we have officers trained in this department that can at least start the initial to help you to try to regain some of your funds or give you some information. Crimes against society, we see an increase of 2.6%. This is DUIs. Uh, our enforcement was, was up. Total calls for service for the year, we answered 102,000 calls, 911 calls, and we did a total of 15,000 traffic stops in our community. And again, so by doing those, we find folks under the influence, 
we're making more arrests there. Uh, that 112 percent increase in drunkenness has to do with this great team called Georgia that won the national championship last year. And when they did, we had chaos in downtown Athens. And so we made about 65 arrests that night with citations and stuff, and that took our numbers over the top. So a lot of that's reflected in that. Um, I'm excited about answering questions. I would like to talk about one more thing, and that's our recruiting. For the first time in four years, we see an increase in the amount of people that we've hired uh, versus what we're leaving. Uh, we have 256 officers, so if we had a 10% attrition rate, which is pretty good by all measures, we'd be losing about 25. We lost le less than that last year, and we hired 31. Uh, and our applicants are uh, reflective of our community. 45% of our applicants uh, are minorities. So we're certainly, certainly proud of our efforts, and one of our focuses for 2020 board is to get more officers out on the road so we can continue uh, to work to make to work with you to make this county safer. Thank you. That's a great job, Chief. Well, thank you. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to step it up here. So uh, I was asked to talk about a five points intersection safety improvement project, which is a part of T SPOS 2023. So T SPOS stands for Transportation Special. So five points intersection intersection safety improvements is a topic I'll briefly talk about. That's part of T SPLOS 2023, and T SPLOS stands for Transportation Special Purpose Local Option Sales Tax. So that was that pinning that you voted for uh, to set up this T SPLOS 2023. And this is one of the many projects in there. And um, I see one of the originators of it here in the crowd. So if you didn't know, your neighbor Sarah Beresford was very instrumental in getting this idea uh, after hearing all of us uh, concerned about the near misses and the intersection there at Five Points. And, um, and I also want to point out John Williams, who at the time was a resident of Five Points, worked with Sarah to come up with some different concepts to help pitch this. And so at the end of the day, uh, the, the Citizens Advisory Committee uh, recommended uh, that there be a million and a half dollars for that project and that was approved by the Commission and approved by all of you. So that is all there, ready to go. And basically, uh, it's for capital improvements to improve safety at the intersection. That could be sidewalks, relocation of crosswalks with ADA accessibility, you know, signal timing and support. And I've learned a lot from Mr. Griffith here, our traffic engineer. You'd be amazed at just what timing can do uh, to change things. Uh, it can it can stop congestion and, and enhance safety for crossing. Pedestrian and corner refuge renovations, pedestrian and street lighting, traffic signals, other general improvements. So we won't be able to do all of that, but we can do some of that to make it safer. And so the process is, uh, for all of our SPLOS products, NT SPLOS, is that there's a user group, um, and there's been folks appointed by the folks on this stage to serve on that user group along with staff, and they will look at different ideas for how to improve those safety uh, safety there along with a design professional and then they would make recommendations to the commission about what to fund and when to fund it. And so we're setting up the user group now. Uh, if you've got a handout, there's a timeline there. Um, it, you know, it depends on what it is. Obviously, it's not going to take us two years to put in a new crosswalk. Okay, but if there's a whole rework of the intersection and the signals and the timing and all that, that might take a little more time. But we're going to get started talking about this year, and certainly uh, by the end of the year, we should know what we're going to do there, and it'll just take some time to implement it. So that's, that's what's going on there. At the bottom of the handout, you can see the webpage if you want to go there and learn more about it or other projects with both t spots and SPLOS. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Kirk. Thank you, Manager Williams. I appreciate it. Glad to be here tonight to see you all and speak with you. That, I know you didn't count on being quizzed, but does anyone here have a, a, would you venture a guess as to what my number one complaint as traffic engineer is? That never happens in Athens. Speed bumps. Speed bumps. Haven't heard it yet. Haven't heard it yet. Parking. That's my number two complaint. They're parking on my street. Speeding. Speeding. My number one complaint is they're speeding on my street. What can you do about it? Well, most people 
don't like to hear the fact that the speed you consider unacceptable in your neighborhood, you have probably driven that fast in someone else's neighborhood. <laughs> All of us may be guilty of that. Now, of course, not me. <laughs> now, we, we, uh, by the way, I've never had a speeding ticket. I don't think I, I could as, as uh, traffic engineer, chief. <laughs> it's on its way, he says. Now, speeding is my number one complaint that I receive, and sometimes there's not a day in the week that goes by that I don't get a complaint about speeding. Would we like to slow the speeds down? Sure, we, we definitely would, and we've been working on that here in Athens. We've got what's known, what will be known as the Residential Traffic Management Program, and as a result of that, uh, it's going to be, well, we're, you, if you know anything about the old neighborhood traffic management program, you know you had to apply for it. You had to meet certain criteria. Well, in this new one, you will, you'll have to do that as well. And in your handout, it kind of explains some of the differences, what we're going to be doing here with this new program. And, and I'm assuming that Mayor Commissioner got to vote. Well, that they, they, they definitely support this for you all. And uh, if, you, if your neighborhood, if your road has over 300 vehicles a day, if your 85th percentile speed is 35 mi 30 miles an hour, excuse me, or over, then you will qualify. And then we will rank all the neighborhoods according to a number of, of issues that they may have. The crashes now will play a part in that where they didn't before, several things. But another thing that I really, uh, everyone that I speak with says, well, my neighborhood's one thing, but what about these major corridors coming into Athens? They, people just fly down these, and they do. It is a pet peeve of mine, and, and like I said, I've never had a ticket and don't intend to get one, but I even get passed on double yellow from time to time, and I'm sure y'all experience, I see all the heads nodding, so you experience the same thing. Now, who said uh, excessive weights at a traffic signal? Well, th that slows people down. Now, come on, give me a break here. We, we're trying to help you out. But we do try to maximize the efficiency of the traffic signals, of all of our signals. I will throw this out to you. I've been here over 40 years. As of today, we still have the same number of staff in traffic engineering that we had in 1983 when I was hired, and probably not a whole lot more money than we did. No, we have a little bit more than we did then. But, you know, money's a big thing for everyone. We understand that, and we, we squawk just as loudly as any other department. But we do, I think we do a remarkable job of what we have. One thing before I get into some exciting things come to you, I'd like to mention that, that traffic engineering, our staff built our own traffic control center. Rather than reach out to a, a contractor or someone, a GDOT or someone to come in and do us a multi-million dollar facility, they built this traffic control center just on dimes, really. We, we, instead of getting the expensive monitors, we even went ahead and got large, giant screen TVs, and we can monitor traffic at quite a few of our intersections. But what I wanted to tell you was that we'd like to, we'd like to show people what we've done. We, we kind of like to brag about what we've done here in Acton. So if you think you'd want to come out into our facility, let us know. We'll try to set that up. It's, it's something that we're working on in the future to, to have regular meetings where people can come out in the evening and view what your tax dollars have been spent on in traffic engineering. So else I'd like to mention that it's truly exciting. If you know anything at all about traffic engineering, you know that we are bound by the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. It's a manual about this thick, and it's put out by the Federal Highway Administration, and we have to follow it to the letter. If I deviate from that manual, then I've opened you all up to a tremendous loss of money through lawsuits and also loss of life, uh, crashes, and we, we never deviate from the MUTCD. However, the MUTCD sets the rules. They are coming out with a new edition this year, and it should be available soon. We've already ordered ours, and they'll be out hopefully within the next couple of months. I've made some cursory uh, views on, online to see what's happening. Some of the changes that they've made, some of the intersections where we've had a few crashes, more than just a few actually, in years gone by, we could not do anything at those intersections. For instance, uh, well, I, I won't name an intersection, but several of the intersections that are problematic are two-way stop only, and you've got free flow traffic on those. They've reduced the requirements for us to go to an all-way stop, and there are several of these that some of you good folks have been really urging us to do something about, and our hands were tied. So that's just one of the changes that's coming, and I think Athens is going to become a, a better better city traffic-wide, or a city-wide for slowing down traffic. I think these things are going to really be exciting. Oh, well, hey, what do I know about excitement? I'm a traffic engineer. It's all for me. <laughs> but we're working on a local road safety plan now, and that's before Mayor and Commission as well. That will be adopted soon. 
We've also got a vision zero goal, a vision, uh, a vision of zero fatalities in Athens. These fatalities hurt, they hurt us all. They hurt me, everyone that occurs on my watch. It's not a good thing and we are doing everything that we can to reduce those. Local road safety plan is a good thing to head forward to with Athens. Also, the Federal Highway Administration has a speed management toolkit. You want to know about these roads that uh, maybe are not in your neighborhood, speed limits are 35 miles an hour or greater. Federal Highway Administration is allowing us to do some traffic calming on some of those as well. So that, that's another exciting thing I feel like coming to Athens, Georgia soon. This year, hopefully, we'll have a, a plan in place for these faster speed highways, and we're going to this. Federal Highway Administration Speed Toolkit is going to be a, a big part of that. If you'd like, you can go online and view that and see, but that will be something that we'll be presenting to Mayor and Commission a little bit later on this year. So a lot of good things going on in traffic, a lot of good things going on here in Athens. Uh, I was, I've been a resident of Athens all my life. Well, I hope not all my life, not yet anyway, but uh, <laughs> I've lived here up to today. We're very thankful for the road system that we have here. And I was told to keep it in about five minutes, Commissioner Wright. Maybe I exceeded my time. I, I appreciate you taking some of Blaine's time. You're great with the mic. I like it. <laughs> no, thank you. Who's next? Grace All right. Good evening. So I get the last two items. Um, and I'm going to do my best to do five minutes or less on each of those. So the two that are on your agenda that I'll be talking about, the first one of those is talking about our new future land use plan. And the last item will be short-term rental. So the two are kind of linked. I'll hopefully make a connection as I talk and it'll make some sense. In the end of 2023, we adopted a new comprehensive plan for Athens Park County. And the very first work item, the very first implementation item out of that plan was to work on our future land use policies. It's been a while since we've done that, about 25 years, since we really took a holistic look at how we're growing and where we should grow. Um, we all know that growth pressure in this town is reality, and it's a blessing, but it comes with a responsibility. How are we gonna do this properly as we go through the next 20 years? And so the future land use map that we're gonna be working on and have started working on really this month started with an engagement process that we completed in the fall. So some of you may have been to our meetings. We had 26 meetings in September and October. We, we got about 2,000 plus comments, and we had a lot of opportunity to meet face-to-face -face and talk about the future of the community and what we want it to look like. Um, coming out of that, we developed five principles that we heard as we were talking to people, these themes that kept coming up. And those themes are what we're going to use to think about how we want to grow in the future. So the five themes are listed there on your sheet. First one talks about redevelopment, putting a focus on redeveloping our areas first. Um, second is to minimize how much sanitary sewer that we expand. Not that we won't, but to try to do that only where necessary and try to use where we've got the existing sewer network in place and maximize its utility. The third thing is to reduce travel distances, and much like Tim was talking about, we all have complaints and issues and frustrations as we try to navigate around town, and sometimes it's just a relationship with growth. So rather than widen the streets, what if we brought our destinations closer to where we live and closer to where we work? That's the future land use approach that we're trying to put forward as we think about the next 20 years. And so there's a series of three bullet points there that reinforce that notion of minimizing the amount of time we spend in a car. Fourth, we want to look at incremental growth everywhere. Um, we're already seeing the market interested in every part of our community. There's a lot to love. The in-town areas have a draw, our sort of suburban character areas have a draw, and our rural areas have a draw as well. And so we want to recognize the fact that the market has an interest in where we are, but let's do it in a way that's responsible, which leads us to the fifth point, which is trying to grow sustainably. Not just environmental sustainability, but fiscal sustainability as well. So right now we are working with uh, an RFP, a request for proposals to hire a consultant to really help us dig into the notion of fiscal sustainability. We know a lot about our environmental issues, what we haven't really studied from a land use standpoint is the cost, the cost of development, and where things make sense and maybe where we've taken a loss. Sometimes taking a loss is okay because it represents community value, but we should know about it and we should factor those things into how we're making decisions. So real quickly, 
those five principles we use to create a growth concept map. And it's kind of a large, kind of fuzzy view of the places we want to grow. And if anybody's interested in looking at that map, it's on our department's website. So accgov.com slash planning. And off on the right, there's a link not just to the map, but to a presentation we made to the mayor and commission um, at a recent work session on the 9th of this month. And I think that will answer a lot of your questions if we don't get to them tonight. So what are our next steps? Um, finishing up this month, we will try to have that consultant on board to start February. In February, we're going to have two things happening. One, we're going to have that infrastructure analysis, that cost-benefit analysis of growth. But we're also going to have a new wave of public input. And we want it to be really creative and interactive and something that, that folks can do online. Or they can come into our office and do it with us in our office where they can talk to us and have some questions answered. But we're going to have a period of talking about how we want to grow physically. Let's talk about design. Let's talk about where things should be. Um, and we're going to compile all of that to create a new future land use map that's also informed by the cost-benefit analysis that we're going to finish up in the spring. Our goal, our promise, is to have a future land use map that's to the county commission by summertime so that we can engage with them in that approval process. Because the very next thing we're going to do once it's approved is start the implementation of the things that are on that map. You know, it's one thing to put your wishes on a list. It's another thing to go shopping for them, right? And so that's what we want to do is start that process of putting the tools in the toolbox to actually realize the benefits and the growth patterns that we want to see. Six minutes on future land use. <laughs> so we're going to try to do short-term rental in four minutes because no, I, no, no. I, I have a feeling five. we'll have questions. Okay. Only five. <laughs> All right. Um, so about 18 months ago, Mayor Gertz asked the Government Operations Committee of the County Commission to look into short-term rentals, to do some research. And that group did. And they dug in very deeply and, and uh, did a lot of legal analysis in conjunction with our attorney's office and looked at a lot of examples around the state. And coming out of that process, they developed a recommendation in November of 2022 that we should have some rules on the books for short-term rentals, because prior to that, we really didn't. Um, and the notion was to make them comparable to how we regulate bed and breakfast uses. Some places those are okay, other places they're okay within limitations, and then other places they're not okay. So using that as a starting point, staff, planning department staff, working with the attorney's office, began drafting some language recently uh, during the fall. And that was brought to the planning commission in December for discussion, and ultimately to a recommendation with the planning commission in January and some of you were there, some familiar faces. Those items have recently been presented to the Mayor and Commission in their work session format, and it is scheduled for a vote at their February 6th voting session. But what's in there? So the regulations do a few things. One, they define what a short-term rental is. Um, you gotta start with a definition. You gotta understand what it is. How is it different from a hotel? How is it different from a bed and breakfast? Um, and then we looked at the way our zoning code is set up, and we set up where it can happen either as a home occupation, which requires an owner-occupant or at least a long-term resident, a permanent resident to be in place, or as a commercial use, which would mean it would come through our normal permitting process for other commercial development. It would get reviewed for all kinds of code compliance, um, both zoning-wise but also structurally. So there's two paths that we're proposing for short-term rental. The question that comes up during this moratorium period is what about those short-term rentals that were operating up to the start of the moratorium? And the answer is this. What we're proposing is to have a legal but non-conforming designation for those folks that may have had that kind of use going on um, but are not meeting the precise letter of this new text amendment when it's adopted. And so that process um, is where we had, as a staff, pro proposed a, a time period where if it changes ownership, you would be required to come into compliance. And the Planning Commission, in their deliberation, amended the language of what we're proposing to say, yeah, that's true, if the ownership changes, you'll have to be brought into compliance. But we're also going to introduce a two-year sunset from the time that the list is created, this legal non-conforming list that identifies folks that were operating prior to the start of the moratorium. You'll have two years from the time that list is done before you need to come into compliance and pull together the paperwork that you need 
to be able to continue to operate if you can. That's, in a nutshell, what's in front of the commissioners right now. Um, this meeting tonight is a great opportunity to follow up, and I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. If I can't answer it, if the folks up here can't answer it, we'll be writing it down and making sure we get an answer back to you. You need a good mic? I better get the mic. <laughs> Bruce, if I might, uh, just telegraph a little bit. So th that was the recommendation. Bruce, thanks for faithfully reporting that. So what you'll hear, just so you're not confused conceptually, is that there are some legal concerns about the two-year sunset. The reason being is that if somebody, an investor, had bought a property, put a lot of money into it, you know, when you go changing laws all of a sudden, you've got to give people time to recoup their investment. And I understand, I understand the hot topic. I live in this community as well. Um, you know, some other communities, nobody else in Georgia has got two years. You know, so that's a new thing. Five years, you know, so there, you're going to hear that conversation. I don't know where it's going to go, but that is a legal concern right now that the commissioners will have to wrestle with. So I hope, I hope that's fair, but that's part of the discussion. Okay. Sure. Thank you. You ready for me? Is your fork? I don't know. It is. Can everybody hear me? Um, well, thank you all for being here tonight. It certainly is nice of you to take time out to come to come and to hear what's going on in your community and for us to be able to answer questions from you. I would like to take a moment to introduce uh, another commissioner that serves with us, and that's uh, Dexter Fisher, who's sitting in the back. And also, we've got two planning commissioners here tonight, uh, Sarah Beresford, as mentioned earlier, and Alex Sams in the back as well. And if y'all don't mind, I'm going to also introduce somebody else tonight. And uh, 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 54 years ago at St. Joseph's Hospital in Atlanta, my mom, who's here tonight, was, was bringing me into this world. On this day. So, Hands us know who to blame. <laughs> so, my mom has been very interested. Her and my dad moved to Atlanta about, or to Athens uh, about a year ago now, and she watches all of her meetings on YouTube. And I know she wanted to she wanted to come tonight to meet the chief and to blame. And also, she she asked me. She goes, you know, it looks like there's a lot of concerns about these STDs that are. <laughs> I said, oh, STRs. Yes. <laughs> So, so at any rate, uh, we'll be glad to open the floor up to anybody that has any questions. Tim, Chief, Bruce, and Blaine, I'll do it, do a good job, and, and uh, we, they, they're here to answer some questions as well. So, uh, Tim's been with us for over 40 years, and he, he knows his traffic stuff. So, uh, so whoever would like to start us off, I'll be glad to be glad to call on you. Allison's got a mic here if you need that. I see Carl's here. Carl may might have some. Hey, hang on, somebody's over there. <laughs> <laughs> Sue, is it? I think this is a good one. Okay. Um, can you use a little example on what the uh, requirements would be to cover from in a two year, like to come up to the codes, physical things? Or? How to come into code? Yeah. Or during that time so period? You're waiting for you. Sure. Um, it, it depends. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm going to project. Okay, <laughs> don't project. All right. Um, there we go. It depends on the property and your zoning and whether or not you're doing it as a home occupation or whether you're doing it as a commercial use. But we'll, I'll try to answer it as a home occupation because I, I think many people will, will have that path to follow. The way that the language is set up, um, the home occupation permit is a very simple thing. It's a counter permit in the planning department. It takes a few minutes to fill out, and it takes a maximum of a day for us to process. Ideally, we process it right there with you while you wait. Uh, the information that we're going to be looking for to process that is, what are you zoned, if you're zoned single family? And if you aren't the owner-occupant, if you are a tenant, if you're a long-term resident of that property, we need permission from the owner-occupant to process the paperwork, and there's a little box for that filled in. And then basically what we're asking for are the circumstances of the property. So if it's a single-family residence, you would check the box for that. If it's a single-family residence and the, the short-term rental is going to be in a structure outside of it, we would have some information that designates which unit it is because you can have one area, either inside the house or in a separate building, that is a short-term rental. And that's, it's, it's not much more rigorous 
well, than that, honestly. And then going to finance for the... Right, so for the review, and then you finish up by going and getting your business tax certificate that gets you in the system. There is the hotel, motel, excise tax that's applicable to short-term rentals. And once you're in their system and, and that process is moving forward, you are now in compliance with the code as a home occupation. If it's a commercial use, meaning it's in a zone where it's either zoned commercially or perhaps zoned multifamily, you don't have the owner occupancy requirement or the long-term resident requirement. Um, but you are gonna be reviewed as a commercial property, which means building code, life safety code, those types of things will come into play that's on par with how we would review commercial property. And there's a process for that, and it's, it, the initial turnaround is a week, and there's some standards to show that you have adequate parking. Um, there's a notification bit of language that you have to provide to your tenants, and kind of a handbook, a little bit of instruction about what to do and who to contact if there's an issue. But it's not meant to be overly rigorous in that regard. It's meant to help, honestly, give some form and structure to, to what these are and where they can go. Does that help? Russell? Thanks. <laughs> yeah. right. um, 21, uh, 21 fatalities on Athens Roads last year, Chief and Traffic Engineer Griffith. Um, and I keep seeing the same roads again and again. Danielsville Road, Nowhere Road, Lexington Road, uh, Atlanta Highway, Broad Street, you know, about every 10 months, intersection of Alps, Atlanta Highway, somebody tries to cross and dies. Um, I know a lot of these corridors are controlled by GDOT, uh, some of these major arterials, and some of us might have noticed GDOT recently repaved Millage Avenue, and now we don't have curb on a lot of Millage Avenue anymore. They put so much asphalt that there's no more curb. So, I guess I'm just curious to hear the perspective of the city leaders. Uh, what are y'all doing to advocate for safety from GDOT? And how are we gonna fix the curves on the Because it's kind of like we're moving in the wrong direction. All great questions, thank you. We have communicated and are in active communication with GDOT regarding the curves on Millage. They have, well, we're not sure exactly how that's going to unfold. That is a, a very good question. Another one of the you, one that you didn't mention that is of concern to me is Harvey Mathis Road and Highway 29. We've had several fatalities at that intersection. That is a GDOT intersection. I've had active conversations with GDOT. The ball is in their lap at this current time. They agreed that uh, something needs to be done. They're discussing what they're going to recommend there at that intersection. I don't know exactly what they'll come up with, but Either we agree with them and allow them to proceed with whatever their recommendations are, or if we disagree, we can come up with the funding if we so desire and do something different. But certainly there are a number of streets and roads in Athens, Clark County, that need some things done to them. That's one of the reasons I went ahead and shared the new MUTCD with you. Some of these intersections that we could not do anything prior to the new manual, we were, our hands were tied. Now we'll be able to do something with those intersections. There are two in mind. I won't share those with you tonight because these things, we, we, have, we have to write them up. We have to get our agenda item on them. Mayor and Commission have to put eyes on them first. So out of respect to them, I'm not going to share those intersections tonight that belong to Athens, Clark County. But we are actively seeking solutions to these things. You know, you, you, it's, it's never my desire to have a fatality on, on a road in Athens, Clark County. Those things hurt. The ones that they truly hurt are, are their family members if there's a fatality there. I've, I've gone to quite a few in the last number of years and I don't like going to any of them. They're, they're horrible to even witness uh, after the fact. So it's not something that we want. We are, we're doing everything that we feel like we can do in our power to make these things better. Of course, here in Athens, I don't think funding would be an issue on these roadways either. If we, if we can come up with something that we can do that'll make the situation better, that FHWA or GDOT or whomever it might be would put their seal of approval on, then I, I think we could, we could make that happen. So, 
And I don't know if I answered your question in its entirety or not. Excuse me, sir. No. Jim, if I could, oh, go ahead, Chief. Uh, so you are correct. We had 21 fatalities in athens Park County last year. We normally have about 10 to 15. In 2022, we had 11 fatalities. And then in 2021, we actually had 25 fatalities. And in each one of these instances, that's, of course, human life is lost. And so we have, we're blessed to have our own traffic reconstruction group. Our traffic officers reconstruct those. We look at every single accident to look what was the cause and what can we do to try to stop that. I can tell you that speed and distracted driving and drug overdoses was the main factors in what caused that increase. Some of them, uh, one on Lexington Road, a gentleman just drove off in the ditch and bumped a tree, but he, he died and it was from a fentanyl overdose and therefore it's a fatality. Uh, we had someone else that was in a motorcycle wreck and got skin up and left the hospital, went to Texas, and then he got septic and passed. So that counts against our numbers. You know, um, we've had several pedestrian uh, fatalities, unfortunately, and we, we look at those and some of those uh, could be suicides. And, and so we're, we're constantly looking. I can tell you one of the biggest things is distracted driving and speed. Last year alone, uh, from pulling the information from the vehicle, the vehicles were going over 100 miles an hour at the time of crash. And outside of being there when that was happening, I don't know how you prevent that, but certainly I think education, awareness, we're constantly looking at our hot spots where these wrecks are happening and putting enforcement on those areas. I just want to follow up on something Tim taught me as well. Uh, so we can invest on state roadways, but we have our own set of priorities as well. So for instance, Hard Mathis, as you told me, it could use a signal and that's several hundred thousand dollars. Can we do it with their permission? Yes, but there's other signals that you would recommend first before that one because of other crashes. Um, as an example of this community doing more than just what the state allows us, I think there is a SPLOS project where, where sidewalks are going in on Lexington Road, which is traditionally a GDOT, but we're not waiting on that, and this is a spot, a T-SPLOS project. Sure, and I'll say also too, uh, too Blaine, there's been several instances where we're putting sidewalks in along the highway, yeah. and, and, um, and also another issue uh, that we did address a couple of years ago was over in the and overall Timothy Road, where, where traffic engineers helped us lower the speed limit on Timothy Road. Carl Jordan was very instrumental in, in helping with that. And, and Chief, I've seen the folks out with distracted driving over on, over on Cloverhurst and, and, and Millage uh, addressing that issue. But also, and correct me if I'm wrong on this plan, I know y'all have been working with GDOT on making sure that the, the milling is done a little bit better on millage, especially at Cloverhurst and Millage, where you sometimes see the water pulling, pull, pulling, pull, pulling, in a sense. Pulling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so at any rate, trying to, trying to work on that some as well. So it's always a challenge, you know, trying to work with state organizations and, and local governments, but, but, but I think we've got uh, some folks here who are, who are aware of the situation and aware of what questions need to be asked and, and, and what we can do to, to help uh, to help lobby in that effort. Carl, you had a question. Yeah, uh, blinding nighttime lighting is out of control in this town. Is there anybody on this state who cares enough to do something about it? We've had an ordinance for 15 years. It's been 20 years since I first promoted an ordinance and it gets worse and worse and worse. Practically all lighting, including that in City Hall, man, you really lit that place up like, like, a, like an operator. Uh, uh, it's all LED. It must all conform. You know, there's no grandfathering of it. Uh, some of it comes through plan review. Stellani looks at those plans. But then uh, a certificate of occupancy is approved, and miraculously the lighting changes. It doesn't conform any longer. I ask this question, does anybody on this state care enough to do something about something that is non-conforming and out of control? <laughs> Well, Carl, I think I think we all care about it. I just I think that no, no, to do something about it. Well, care enough to do something about it. And uh, and, and y'all you know, can I mean the folks that do the do the plans review, they have to follow the ordinance that we have on the books. 
So certainly looking at the lighting ordinance again may be an option that we can look at. I know you'd like for us to do that. We've talked about that several times, so I'm doing that. But, but uh, you make you make some good points, Carl. So thank you. And uh, Allison, Amy, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Chief. I was just wondering how you all handle nine one one calls involving mental health emergencies, and do you have staff to accompany those calls? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so two forms. One, uh, we're very blessed to have our co-responders, which is our officers that are paired with the uh, licensed clinical social workers. We currently have three teams right now. Uh, as I understand, Advantage is in the process of hiring the fourth. We have officers available and ready, and the amount of calls that we receive as it relates to mental health is, is really just, it's, it's, it's bad. And so... We've adopted several things. One, 100% of our officers, to include just themes, are fully trained uh, in mental health response and what that looks like. We use DR goggles, stuff like that, to put them, this is the mind of someone who's schizophrenic, to help them understand what the people are going through. And our focus is on health, because it's mental health. It's not to put them in jail, but try to get them the help they need. And so our relationship with Advantage and things of that nature is working well. Uh, we need more teams. Um, but we continue to see those issues and how we respond to them. And also, I remember a few years back, we had several officer-involved shootings. Uh, that's traumatic for the families of those who lost loved ones. But please don't forget, it's very traumatic for our officers who never wanted to do that and the amount of counseling they need for that. And so we instituted ICAT training, which is slowing the response down, trying to save lives. So sometimes it may take more resources and more time but it's better than rushing into a situation and have to have our officers forced with a deadly force situation. So there's a lot of things we're doing on all fronts. Thank you. Well, if I, if I could, Mike. Sure. So another thing that, that the past commission and this commission has been tracking very closely is behavioral health. So if you didn't know, as part of the 2020 SPLOST, there was funds that you approved to partner with Advantage Behavioral to build a new facility that might be an alternative to the jail. So there's a place, another place we can take folks. Uh, and, and that was not enough money to do much. So this commission approved ARPA funds for behavioral health to go to Advantage and supplement that too. So in addition to the ongoing enforcement, there's some investment in infrastructure that should be able to help for And I think it's going to add an additional 60 beds, is that right? For, that's right. And it, they're having to phase it because of all the construction escalation, but those things are happening right now. Okay. See, so we have Hank over here. Hank used to be on our planning commission as well. I think he served on number four. So Thank you very much. Yes, um, I have two, two quick, one, one comment. I'd like to say thank you to the Mayor of Commission and Traffic Department for moving forward to the neighborhood traffic plan that's being moved forward. Because uh, I complain a lot about Spring Tree Road, which is cut through, it has no shoulders, has no sidewalks, and has kids riding their bicycles down that street. It's a neighborhood street, so there's a lot of neighbors, a lot of cut through traffic. I'm glad to see this number four on your list. Secondly, I am a 15 year short term rental owner in Five Points. Never got the grade less than five stars for our property there. And my, my main concern is we, we know our neighbors, we're concerned about it. A few bad apples are making us all look bad. Um, and my concern for the future is I understand that the two year sunset that you can apply and make sure. I just want to make sure that a non occupied short term rental can also apply for the use back over for commercial use. And, and again, I just want to emphasize that it's real important to note that not all of these short term rentals are causing problems, and we certainly don't want to. We don't. Thank you. Okay, Sue. So. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have something? Okay, Bruce is. Well, yeah, the, the, the quick answer is yes. There's a path for that property to go to for us to take a look. Um, like I mentioned before, it does depend on the zoning. Um, if it is in an RS zone, which a lot of the properties in town are, um, it would be that home occupation route. Um, but happy to take a look at it with you. Sure. <laughs> I'm um, hi for the. My name is Tom, by the way. Uh, for the residential traffic management um, program, um, could that also like in, possibly coordinate with the future land use development uh, planning? Um, I guess committee, because in terms of uh, overall long term 
solutions to reducing uh, traffic as well as fatalities um, is because Athens is going to continue to grow. Um, longer term solutions, in my opinion, involve um, more um, transit availability, like public transit availability and denser housing. Is that something that's being uh, looked at as possible solutions for long term uh, uh, traffic decreasing? Well, that's a great question that you ask. These, uh, these roadways that we're looking at aren't with. They will be adjacent to residential zoning per the ACC ordinance. I don't know if that answers directly your question or not, but from what I, I, I'm sorry, I don't hear that well, and I could hear a lot of, not feedback, but something fuzzy going on there. Bruce, I can. Bruce, Bruce, I'll let him address it. Thank you, you probably heard it better than I did, Bruce. No, it's a great question. And as we're developing the future land use plan, we are talking to every other development adjacent department of the government to try to sync up with their programming and their planning as well. So we recognize that as we're talking about density and we're talking about community design, that also relates to roadway design. And if, if the goal that we've heard is to minimize trips and to manage traffic, we're already working with Tim's team and we've had a couple really good meetings to sit down and talk about these targeted locations where we would like to see and where it makes sense for density to come. We're gonna to have to slow traffic down. We're gonna to have to provide for other forms of transportation. We're gonna to have to make our transit system respond to that development growth as well and make sense out of it. Um, we've got side work network, sidewalk networks that need to be completed and filled out. Um, but we also recognize we still have to plan for vehicles. So how to do that appropriately is the challenge, particularly in these in-town locations. But yes, there are, those conversations are going on together for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sue. So it will get to you. Um, First of all, I apologize because I was going to try real hard to keep my mouth shut when I say anything, but I can't control myself. So uh, I'd like to have a few minutes to talk about my experience with BBROs, Airbnbs, and what I call the issue of small hotels in Five Points, as I prefer to call it, small hotels. Uh, there are now at least 35 absentee owners at, that we know of in Five Points for these hotels. And I was told there's over 900 in Athens Park County. I don't know if that's accurate, but I was told that. Um, I have to read this so I'll forget things. We don't have any problem with homeowners who want to rent out a room or two to pay their taxes or whatever and live on the site. That's not the issue. But we do have concerns with out of city, out of state, or maybe even out of country homeowners who buy these homes, rental conglomerates, and business ventures or tax write-off, which a lot of them are. Um, my name is Sue Stevenson. I am 89 years old, and I've lived in Five Points for 50 years or more. I, I first lived on Bluefield Street, and then on Hope Avenue for graduate school, and then I bought a home over on Village Terrace, and now I am on Witherspoon Road, which is the corner of Witherspoon Court. <clears throat> and that's in Glenwood and Five Points. This is on a formerly quiet six-house little cul-de-sac, and I'm at the bottom of a hill. I worked in Northeast Georgia for 25 years at the mental health clinic now called Advantage, and I look forward to a quiet retirement in a quiet neighborhood. About two years ago, uh, the house was sold. This was Chester Sosby's house. He was the pharmacist at Hodgson's, and they sold the house to a couple from Texas and they remodeled, and about a year later, the house was sold or flipped to some older, older folks, older men from Texas, uh, who purchased it for a BBRO. I was, that's a vacation rental property. I was told at the time that 20 people could live in it. I think that's been reduced, I hope. Um, very quickly, huge, huge equipment was brought in very quickly. They cut all the trees, all the greenery, all the shrubs, put in a pool, a pool house, and it looks like a couple condos on top of each other in the back. Um, and this, they look like they exceeded the city limits to height, we're not sure. My neighbor can look from her dining room right into this mess, and uh, I can see an electronic blue light day and night. The next thing was a big gravel truck came and dumped about a ton of gravel on an unauthorized area that was used to provide runoff for the water that came from the back of this property. 
their water now becomes a small river and waterfall that runs through the, my backyard, particularly during heavy rains, which we did have recently, and I had a river. Um, I do have pictures of this on my cell phone, as, and the city did come and take pictures, and I do appreciate that. This water could take out my driveway wall. The dump truck of gravel was so large to get in this tiny area, they dumped about a fourth of the gravel into the street, and then it ran down into about three or four sewers, gutters, and the city had to come out and dig out the sewers. And then the gravel ran down my street to get to my mailbox. I had to drive my car, I mean, it was in the game. I had to drive my car to get to the mailbox, mail my bills, and so forth. Um, okay. The city did come out and make the hotel owners clean up this mess, but the problem is not solved. Last of all, my question is, why are these hotels allowed in single-family neighborhoods? Do homeowners have any rights to the peace they should come, that should come with a home, home ownership in five points? What is the agenda of the city to allow this? That's what I'd really like to know. There's something behind it. How do I solve a serious water problem? It was largely solved before this hotel moved in due to the ditch that was covered with the gravel. Why are there no serious consequences to anything that seems to happen? Uh, have we forgotten? Okay, okay, one more thing. Have we forgotten the young minority team who was had and who was shot and killed at an Airbnb over there on Northview where the old Waffle House was? And this sort of thing can happen when we don't know who's coming in. The last question is, do I need a lawyer? Maybe there's one here. So, so thank you for your comments. And uh, it's certainly, certainly, I know Blaine and, and our uh, Cancer are very well aware of the situation going on at your house. And uh, I saw uh, Cancer this morning at a government operations committee meeting. He assures me that he's, he's working uh, to get that gravel up out, out from your yard and, and under that magnolia tree of yours. So hopefully you'll see something something happened here soon that, that will address your concerns. Okay. And they should have and they should have put some silk fence up by now, I'm not sure. Okay. Well see so I'll stay in touch with you to make sure that we stay on top of this. So thank you. Uh, yes, Ms. Clapper. Um, my question relates to traffic safety, parking, rental, future cleaning, and transportation. I will that together. Now there's one. Okay. Okay. Um, so my question relates to traffic safety, parking, rentals, future planning, and transportation. So it's all tied together. As you know, we're a college town. <laughs> and my question relates to what are the measures within the future planning and also with um, transportation issues? What? How are you working? with the University of Georgia um, in, in planning trans for transportation. Currently, the students are using our street as a parking lot. They park in the morning, get out of the cars with their backpacks, and a lot of them are um, parking overnight and not coming back to the cars, sometimes for days later. So I don't think that we can, as a college town, can um, legitimately just do our own planning and ignore, you know, the relationship with the University of Georgia because I think I think all of it goes hand in hand. So, what what are the measures that are in place, or or what are the plans to work with the University of Georgia as you go forward? That's a great question. Thank you. I mentioned at the beginning that that that's my number two complaint. They're parking on my street. And it's no surprise to you all that it's not you parking on someone else's street. It is students. They're looking for a free place to park. And I understand it. I was a student here at one time myself. I get it completely. Back then in the, the late 70s, there, were, there was almost adequate parking, I guess you could say, for students. We are uh, in active conversation with UGA on many projects. We have a, a monthly meeting with some of their staff, and we have a quarterly meeting on a larger scale with their staff. I don't guess it's a surprise to some of you, but the University of Georgia is proposing two park and ride lots at the Loop, and uh, one of them, I believe, is Millage Avenue. The other one is College, College uh, Station Road. 
and they're wanting to put some parking there in those those areas in, in the medians where the on ramp or off ramps converge there with with the loop 10. So that's something that we feel like would, would take a load off. That's in the, the planning stages right now. I know the University of Georgia is also planning a parking deck out off of College Station Road over near Barnett Shoals Road at the vet school. They're proposing a large deck there as well. We've had quite a bit of conversation with them regarding the traffic signal there at that location. Uh, certainly if they build there, that signal would need more, some modification. So we're in an active conversation, as I said, with that. That's as far as me being able to elaborate beyond that, I really can't. Blaine might be able to share a little bit more with you <coughs> on those lines. So I'd echo what Tim is saying. We have a great relationship, uh, the staff with the university, and they have a meeting with their peers, and I have a meeting with our peers at the university <coughs> monthly, and we discuss all these things. If you didn't know it, um, some of the traffic signals and some of the streets in and around the university are the universities to have, not ours. Now, we do have um, an agreement where we maintain those signals for them. But for instance, uh, you may have noticed where uh, they took out the rail bridge there at um, Baldwin. So over on, so that came out and they're looking at that whole corridor there, which has a couple of our oldest traffic lights in Athens, Clark County. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're planning on how to do that and do we put back some pedestrian throughway there where the bridge used to be. So we have conversations like that on a routine basis, so we're coordinating well. And, and also, uh, I do believe, with Chief, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but we, we are increasing you know, parking enforcement in, in the Five Points area, and I think you have hired somebody to help address, address that. Sure, we have. We had a recent employee of 30 years retire, wanted to come back part-time. We said he was very interested in doing parking details. These are, there's a lot of calls. We stay backed up on calls. We're fortunate, you know, in Atlanta or metro areas, you got to wait two to three hours to get a a response from an officer there. We're pretty good at, at answering calls, parking. Uh, we get a lot of complaints, probably one of the major issues is parking. And so we've hired this officer. What he's doing is his full-time job is to be hitting these hot spots and towing cars. I think they towed six today over by Parkview. I mean, it's just daily, they're constant. And so he's doing a lot of uh, enforcement trying to address them. And parking on sidewalks. See, Kevin, yes. I think you have a question. Exactly. That's one, one of my big questions. First, I'd like to thank you all for being here to answer our questions and listen to all our grievances. I, I appreciate you guys taking the time. But, uh, Chief Sultan, that is a question I have because uh, I, we live on the same street and I can attest that parking is always a problem. It's a daily problem, whether it be uh, parking on the sidewalks, parking on the yellow curb, blocking fire hydrants, blocking driveways so people can't get in and out. And the times I've called to talk to officers about it, I've met with them. They say, I've been told numerous times that they will not enforce parking on my street. I've been, one officer said it's because parking on your street sucks. Another one said, this is an officer discretion. We don't have to do it. And I explained that I think it's very dangerous. You know, since my boys were at Barra, we had to go out into the street, in the Village Avenue, because UPS and uh, FedEx is on the sidewalk. Blaine, I talked to you about this, and you were going to get back to me, and I but never heard from you about it. And I've uh, called well, the, I'm gonna address the that. captain on our street, uh, in our districts, many, many times, and never gotten a call back. So I'm wondering, why do officers say they will not enforce parking on our street, and why are we being denied that? Well, I'll, I'll turn over to Chief, but since you called me out directly. So part of the problem is that you have these uh, landscaping services and stuff, you know, they'll pull up on the side of the road or it's a university vehicle, and by the time officers get there, they're gone. Okay, so a lot of times it's something that bugs the heck out of you, but we can't do much about because we're not right there. And the chief uh, had taken the extraordinary step of getting somebody who's dedicated to that, and we hope that that's going to help the responsiveness. Sure, and I'll make sure that he's available to you. You have his number so y'all can work together. He loves right party tickets. And, uh, so he's game. But I will say this, that is a huge challenge because it's no parking over there where you're at. There are kids playing the sidewalks. But I think a lot of the challenge is when like college landscape, they were parking on the side. Well, now we went directly to that company and their management and said, look, y'all got to help us. And they've agreed not to park over there. So I think that's been resolved. But then a new Amazon driver drives up, parks to run and drop a package off. And then by the time we're getting there, gone. And then some officers, and, and you're right, they do have, they can cite or not cite. That, that the law gives them that benefit and that discretion. Um, and so 
I've been pretty clear I wanted them sited over there, and I thought it got better, and then again, well, it'll pop back up, but I'll make sure you have Officer Ward's number. Could I? Could I? Mm -hmm. that. If, 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 that they will, I've been told many times still that they will not do that. Last time cars were blocking driveways, I was told that they'll call, but they're not even going to take it from So they'll call the owner and just ask them to move it, and then the officer will ask each other. The cars are still there. All right, if, if I might address one of your concerns, you mentioned couldn't get out of your driveway. If you'll call me at Traffic Engineering, the commission allows us to yellow 10 feet either side of your driveway. If it's not yellowed, we'll be glad to do that. A lot of times that does help the situation. It, it actually stops it. We, uh, we had one intersection a couple of weeks ago that we went out and had to, to yellow it because it was unsafe. There was no way an emergency vehicle could get through. If they did, it would have probably resulted in a head-on. We yellowed that intersection 50 feet all the way around. The commission gives us the administrative authority to do that. We can also yellow the curb in a fire hydrant. So anyone here, if you have those issues, please call us. We'll do it now. We wait until we have enough to keep our crew busy for a full day before we send the striping crew out. It takes them about three hours to clean that machine up so that it won't set up and, and ruin. So we like, obviously, we want a full day's work before we have to clean we it. We take advantage of that. I appreciate it. They've been very calm and responsive. We, we'll we'll, it hasn't we'll certainly do that. Parking there, but, you know. So we appreciate what you've done. Yes, Thank yes. You. And if you'll send me uh, his name. Sometimes I do ignore the other. Um, I, I want to add in that a uh, project that Mike and I have been working on um would be uh with the ma county manager and it's complicated because one thing that one of our streets i think and the village is g dot is to designate some um loading zones so that looking for the key spot in the left turning lanes uh maybe where some of those balusters are you can picture it in front of five and ten if we can designate the place for them to park so that they're not pulling up and um, so that's a project that we need to get um, move forward on and learn how we can get uh, that designation. And, and if I might, I'm sorry, Mike, but there's also another remedy for you, and that's our residential parking permit program, which Commissioner Wright has one coming through now. So with a petition, you can, uh, for certain streets, uh, petition that it's residential parking by permit only. Now. That solves some problems, create others. You know, we have guests come over, so that's something to consider. But there are other remedies out there. Okay, we've got two hands back here, and then our new officer up front is waiting patiently because I forgot when I was up here that she had to come over. Uh, this is just a small update. Uh, we have a question for Bruce. Regarding the Bruce Street Parking Permit, this is just a specific question for Bruce regarding the short term rental on Winter Spoons Court. And it comes to our knowledge that the owners have been faking owner occupancy since last year with a Texas registered car with flat tires in the driveway. Nobody lives there, but they're uh, cleared to take 16 renters. Is, is, is that grandfathered in to be faking residents? I'll, I'll say this. Um, enforcement of the ordinance in whatever form that it ultimately is adopted is being taken very seriously. And some of the revenue from the excise tax that will be collected for the short-term rentals will be used to hire a staff person that's going to focus on the administration of the program. So that these types of issues, to the best of our ability, um, we can look into and do the research and be able to bring first through an education process. But if that fails, then we'll have compliance measures that we'll use. Um, these types of stories where we have a lot of creativity in, the, in, in our community um, to manage permitting after the fact, um, we know that happens and, and we've seen a lot of things. Um, we, we aren't uh, easily fooled. Um, the challenge for us is gathering the evidence and it is staff intensive, um, but it is something we're very serious about and, and if it's on the books, we're going to enforce it. Well, and Bruce, you cannot prohibit people that live out of state from owning the property and doing it. There, there's a constitutional law maxim that an attorney just recently told me I can't remember. And presently, we have no definition at all. So there's so no law in the books that prevents that. There's nothing for us to enforce. It hasn't been adopted yet. It, it's up for vote. It's right. It's up for both February 6th. Okay, I need to touch base here because when Dylan was talking, um, she had asked a, for a question. And then well, I it was so, more of a comment. Okay, but, yeah. you can make a comment. And then Mike, um, I think, is watching the class. Okay. 
Just very quickly, I wanted to touch base on uh, trade. Um, I'm new, I'm 22 years old, moved from South Florida, came here after Georgia. I was not gonna talk, but I love talking, so. You can stand up. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I don't care about that. But I just wanted to say the new officer base, of course, that we're in right now, has been very effective. Uh, you mentioned mental health and that ICAP program that Chief Salters was talking about. It has opened my eyes. I knew about mental health, but it definitely opened my eyes and we've done scenario-based training. We do death by PowerPoint, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Um, just overall, I just wanted to say that because I've heard a lot of people talking, but I just want about, you know, officers, and I can't speak for those officers. I'm new, um, very new. I don't start field training until three weeks later, so except for that. But just more so, uh, just wanted to mention that training is very effective. And I'm learning so much as a very ready officer, and I hope that I can, you know, be uh, advantage to you guys in the city. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm good. Mary, okay. Mary. Let's see. Mary, then Hillary, then Michael. And then, then we're approaching, approaching the rich. And then we're approaching the uh, uh, <laughs> bedtime. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, this kind of covers um, the Five Points intersection, traffic, and enforcement. So um, it's great to, en to enhance the Five Points intersection. And I know we're all grateful for that. But it has the consequences, as many things like that do of increasing cut through traffic through the neighborhoods. And I happen to live on a cut through street and right very close to a, a big cut through intersection. And so my question has to do with a couple of things that have to do with stop signs. And I'm also excited to hear about the neighborhood traffic plan. Um, stop signs, I live in the neighborhood of Parkway, um, Greenwood, Carlton Terrace, Village Heights. And just to give an example, there's a there's a two-way stop at Parkway and, and Greenwood that's through on um, Parkway. There's a two-way stop at the next intersection at Millage Heights that's a through on Millage Heights. And then the next intersection is a four-way stop. And I could go to the next corner and do the same thing in, in reverse. It's very confusing. You have to stop and think, okay, is, is cross traffic coming through? In which direction do I, you know, is it a four-way stop? And I live there, so I travel these streets all the time. And it's still confusing to me sometimes. I have to really pay attention to the stop signs. So my one question is, is there any way to make those more consistent? So when you're going through a neighborhood, you know every intersection is going to be a four-way stop, or this street's going to be through all the way through. So that's, that's the first question. Then the second question is, you know, people are going to say, well, so what? Nobody stops at stop signs anyway. And I see that at one of the intersections just two houses down from my, from my house, nobody ever stops there. Um, and, it's, and it's a cut through between Millage and Lumpkin. And so I don't know if there's technology, if you've thought about installing cameras. I mean, I, think, I feel like people kind of scoff at stop signs. They are a suggestion. And um, maybe if there was some real enforcement where people were getting tickets in the mail, um, they might, it might help. They might start not cutting through our neighborhood. All great questions, all great concerns. I, I understand those concerns. I, I would like to, well, first of all, the consistency aspect. Those stop signs in that neighborhood that you're referring to, they all except two of those, I believe, predate me. So they've been there for many, many years. Now, I mentioned the manual on uniform traffic control devices earlier. That's what we are bound to live by. It requires a great deal of traffic to get a cross street, cross street to stop. I don't have those exact figures in my head to share with you tonight, but it's a good number of those for an eight hour period out of the day. Most likely if I went and did a study at those intersections, to look at those stop situations, if it's an all-way stop, we probably have to pull two of those stop signs out. You realize that they do slow traffic, even if it is a slow-and-go situation, which 
I don't advocate. I'm certainly not sitting next to the chief. I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't either. Anyway, that's a pet peeve of mine. I won't tell my wife for getting stopped the other day for rolling through one, but uh, she, she knows better. So thankfully, she didn't get a ticket. It wasn't in Clark County anyway. But I will say this. One of the reasons that we're not allowed to put stop signs at an intersection where they're not warranted is the fact that it breeds contempt for the traffic control device. We had a meeting over on Sunset Avenue. Were anyone here a couple of years ago where we had a, a meeting there on traffic, uh, on the neighborhood traffic management program? Well, as we were standing there for the hour, we had the meeting out in the yard. There was a stop sign right adjacent to us. And at the end of the meeting, they said, have you noticed everyone ran the stop sign? I said, yes, I, not only have I noticed, that's really a source of irritation for me because many years ago, Mayor and Commission decided that they knew better than traffic engineering and they voted to install those stop signs. They didn't meet warrants and they breed contempt for those devices. People know that 99 times out of 100, they'll pull up to that stop sign and no one will be there and they'll just blow on through. Human nature, right? I don't know if I've answered your questions. If you're requesting, if you're requesting us to do a study, some of those may change. That's, that is certainly something that we could do. I will say that we have two people in our studies division, and it's a constant challenge. That, well, we cannot keep up with the request for traffic studies that we have, so we have to hire consultants to do some of those. We just hired something, hired a consultant the other day to do one simple study, as, as you mentioned here, and it costs us $9,500 just to do that study. So, of course, money is an issue there. One, one thing, Mayor Aaron, Tim, and Blaine is maybe looking at, and we've done this a little bit on, on, in this area, is to put up the, the uh, through traffic does not stop sign. Yeah. So that is, that is something that we can do, and, and we base those upon crashes. Typically, if we have crashes at an intersection, we're going to put those cross traffic does not stop signs up. And if that's something you'd like, I'd be happy to look at that for you. I think you've done it over here and yeah. uh, on the way in this okay. morning. Okay, very good. You learn how to drive there because you have to, you can't stop. I mean, you, you, you know, this person's right here, and you can see they're about to go, and you just kind of got to roll through there. The guy still tried to come through. But what I thought I heard you say to answer her question directly is the new MUTCD manual may have the flexibility to be able to get these all four-way stops at certain, the cross streets. At certain streets, yes, sir. It's, it's much more lenient than the old manual. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Hillary? Um, this question is for Mr. Williams and Mr. Lonnie Moore about the short-term rentals and kind of specific about the sunset um, deliberations, I guess. And it would seem to me that the um, situation that they're describing on Witherspoon wouldn't be legal, not conforming. Like, that doesn't seem like that would be the right term for something that would have 16 people in a single-family neighborhood. And I know that um, working for Athens Park County, you would want to prioritize the rights of people who are living here and paying taxes, going to work um, over out of uh, county, out of um, state, out of country owners. Uh, so that I am doing some research, it seems that I saw some that were six months, not five years, two years. Two years seems very, very generous. And I, I guess that, of course, none of us want to pay the big legal fees that come with lawsuits. And, um, but is it, it just seems like overly generous given the difficulty that some people are living with currently. Well, I'm no attorney, and the one that I saw in the background left, I think, Kalki. Uh, but my understanding uh, is that case law has shown that a longer sunset period, if you will, allows people time to recoup it. Now, from a policy perspective, we're not advocating either way, but what I, I just, I was telling y'all in advance, so when you come to the February 6th meeting and you watch it and you hear this, you're like, they didn't say anything about that, so I wanted to mention it. But the attorneys are, I mean, you can still do it, it's just that you could be open to challenge on that. Um, so that's, um, the other thing is 16 people in your house. Well, you may have your family over for Thanksgiving and have 16 people in your house. And right now, as Bruce said, we just don't have anything on the books that prevents that from happening on the short-term rental side of things. And that's what the commission is trying to remedy is at least get something going. So let me just say this too. Uh, Y'all, part of this is, and, and so you mentioned this too, we're not sure how many we've got. You know, by one software company, we've got 750. By another, we've got 1,200. So the software's been bought. We're advocating for a position that person's gonna do this full-time. 
Uh, and then we're, the commission's going to get something on the books, and we're going to go forward, but that's not the end of the story. Once we learn more, we start getting people in here, we find out what the problems are, and we got the enforcement going on, then they can always amend it, strengthen it, whatever it calls for. So this first step is not the end of the road, but we have to start somewhere. And, and I appreciate you, Bruce, saying, well, you got to have a definition first. You know, so that has to get done. we got to get something on the books. We've got to start registering these things and get somebody hired, and then we can do more. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. I think it's good to have face-to-face uh, -face with public officials, and I think it provides a measure of accountability. I have three quick things uh, I want to mention. One is five points. Um, you know, when I hear $1.5 million, that sounds like a lot, but it's really not a lot of money. That's a very complicated intersection, and you start going back 100 yards from that intersection, it gets more complicated. So. 1.5 is just a drop in the bucket. And second of all, it doesn't address the totality of the problem of getting to five points, particularly up Lumpkin Street, that starts at the bottom of Lumpkin Street and uh, Old Lincoln Highway, and Tim and I have talked about this at length, and it doesn't address the blind intersection at Westlake. So I think you really need to go back and reevaluate that whole corridor and what the totality of the need is right there if you really want to do something at that five points intersection. The same thing is uh, back to the STR and I've sent the commission some comments. And one of the things is the moratorium. A moratorium is not any good unless you enforce it. And we have heard some comments at the last commission meeting that there are uh, STRs that have come online since the moratorium was put in effect. So my question is, what are you going to do about it? And if you don't do something about them, why should any developer, real estate agent, owner expect that you're going to enforce anything that's in a new ordinance? So we would like to understand what you plan to do about people who are in violation of the ordinance. And the third thing is um, the growth plan. Um, you know, athens Clark County is the smallest geographical county in the state of Georgia. And it has its own beltway, which should tell you something. So everything you talk about translates into higher density. And so one of the questions I'd like to hear addressed publicly at some point in this debate about growth is how much is enough? There's only so much you can shoehorn into the smallest geographical county in the state of Georgia and preserve quality of life. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mike. Okay, Rich. Uh, Rich, you take us home here, Rich. Well, yeah, this is sort of a follow-up to, to Sue's comment on sure. short-term rentals. And I think many of us have seen the article in the flag called the op-ed by Leon Dallas regarding the situation that exists across from him where a six-bedroom house is accommodating up to 30 people, you know, per weekend events. And I guess my question is, with respect to the proposed regulations for short-term rentals, if that's passed on February 6th, how is that going to impact Sue's situation where 12 people to 16 people are occupying a six bedroom house with you know all the cars that come with that and what's happening over uh, on Riverbend? Yeah, those are good questions, Rich. And I would say this, you know, certainly we are looking at looking at the, the language that the planning has sent to us uh, in the text amendment. But I'll also say this too, once we get that software and once we get the, the short-term rental person on board. Then we can go and look at the other ordinances that we have on the books that help address the noise ordinance and, and such as that. Am I, am I right heading in that direction? I mean, yes. it seems to me that we have some other ordinances that can help address noise ordinance and parking in situations like that. Does that help at all, Rich, or not? Kind of, but I think also in this first phase, there needs to be some teeth included, meaning if someone is in violation. Like there's a home occupation that, license. Yeah. You know, the first offense, you get a pass. The second offense, just as you see as, as someone who goes to an Airbnb, sometimes it says if there's a noise complaint, you're going to be assessed a $600 fee. Well, I think the owners of an Airbnb should maybe get a pass the first time 
a fine of, let's say, 750 the second time, uh, there's a nuisance complaint that they don't address. The third to fourth time, they just need to lose their license to operate. Yeah, I, 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 I don't disagree with what you're saying. I think if you're a nuisance in a single family neighborhood, then that needs to be addressed in due course. It certainly does. So okay. In the first two years, if you were already existing in your non owner occupied employees, unless you violate some other ordinance, there's nothing that counts for right. to do. That's what's in the Texas Amendment right now. Yeah. They're just saying repeat. I said that's what's in the text amendment that's before us right now. But so, uh, you have, if you're if you're currently operating, you, there's a two year sunset that's being recommended to the mayor commission. So after that two years, if you're not a, a, if it's not your primary residence, then you need to find a way to make it your primary residence so that you come. And I want to use this term: the legal non-conforming uh, part of it, or but, the legal non But the, the point is that. In those two years, if you are one of the, if you are owner occupied, unless you know in the situation of Witherspoon or Rich was saying, if you if you don't violate some other ordinance, parking ordinance or a noise ordinance, something like that, or you aren't caught doing that or you can't prove it, there's nothing the county can do until those two years are up. So for two years, you're going to have to live with it basically, unless, and I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to point fingers. I'm just saying I think it's important for people to understand that. That's not necessarily okay. true. Okay. So, so the key here is legal non-conforming, right? So one of the things that, there we go. One of the things we have to identify is were you in existence in a way that was legally recognized prior to the start of, mor of the moratorium? So there, and that's why we've, we're hiring this vendor to put together the software to help develop the list of those places that we're operating in a way that we can deem legal. What, what, in a single family neighborhood, like in Witherspoon, what's legal and what's not prior to the moratorium? Well, prior to the moratorium, we, we really, that's part of the challenge, is we had no definition for short term rental. Right. So now we'll have that definition, but, but those folks have to come forward. We have to have identified that they were operating in a way that we can recognize. <laughs> and if they can't substantiate that, then they don't make it onto the legal non conforming list. If they don't make it onto the legal non-conforming list, they're in violation of the code, and we can move to enforcement proceeding. What makes it not? What makes them not legal? That's what I'm talking. Because you're saying there was no definition, so what makes it not legal? They had to be recognized as operating in a way, whether it's through an online third-party source that we can identify, that the vendor is going to identify for us, or if they come forward and provide documentation that supports the fact that they were functioning as a short-term rental. If it, for lack of a better term, if it's some sort of bootleg operation that doesn't meet any of those definitions, they are not legal and they would still just be non-conforming and then we can have enforcement proceedings to deal with them. But, but now that particular instance, that particular instance, I, I think we've got to dig into, we've got two baskets of enforcement issues. We've got use, people being in there, but then we've got the problems that have come from gravel and noise and trash and parking that are another basket of enforcement issues. So um, it, I, I think I'm maybe skirting your issue, it looks like, from the well, look on your face. But I still don't if you didn't have a definition of short-term rental until, until you passed this, then how was somebody, I mean, I get it if they, if they had violated some residential, some building code in the rest where they are, that's a whole different thing. But what is it that makes them not? What, you didn't have a definition for short-term rental, so how can they be non-conforming to what do a definition you didn't have? I don't understand. That's the answer. Well, the moratorium was anybody that had before now had done it. Had done it. Exactly. And if you had done so it before, there, but there was no, there was nothing. So well, we, we can't, we can't, it. we can't enforce the moratorium. That's the answer. That's all. I'm, I just wanted to make sure. I'm not arguing. I'm just trying to be. No, I know, I know, but I know there's questions about. It. I just want to be clear. Yeah. We can't enforce a moratorium right now without the software. You know, we just can't. Okay, y'all. Okay. So. Last my turn here. We've got Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Commissioner, neighbor. This is actually not about short term rentals, it's about traffic. Um, just kind of circling back around to some comments that were made earlier. I think we just asked for law enforcement, traffic engineering to you know, keep in mind that 
where we live in particular, I think this is a problem all over Athens, but Five Points in particular, being adjacent to the university, that a lot of the normal ways of thinking about traffic don't apply. Like, we have, I don't even know how many thousand. So last year's freshman class at UGA was 6,000 18-year-olds. Let's just say that two-thirds of them are driving. So every year in the fall, we get 4,000-ish 18-year-old drivers driving in our neighborhood. So if you, when you respond to concerns about intersection safety with, you just gotta be really careful. Well, a lot of those people coming and driving through, especially in this area that Marianne's talking about, I live there too, this intersection of Parkway and uh, Carl Terrace is just a disaster waiting to happen. And so many people are cutting through there and they haven't been through before or they're 18 to 22 and they're, I mean, I was driving in front of a person today and she, I looked in my rear view mirror and she was stopped at the stop sign but taking a selfie of herself while she stopped. It was actually so cliche, it was amazing. But I was just asked to kind of consider that I do think that Five Points has a unique, in its sort of proximity to the university and the way that people are trying to cut through to avoid the intersection, I think we just need to think about it a, a little bit differently and understand that that is something that makes Athens kind of unique and Five Points even more so, that we have these young drivers and people new to town. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate that. So yeah, that's a wrap for tonight. And if you have any more comments, we're certainly glad to take them over email. Before we leave, I just want to recognize Kathy Hoare, former commissioner, and former commissioner Carl Jordan. Uh, uh, Thank you, Kathy. Thank you.